Good morning, good morning, and welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are joining me for the very first time, my name is Dahlia, and I have been sharing the wonderful word of God with you on this channel. Yes, 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 yes. And um, I post on Mondays, and I post on Fridays, where Fridays um, is prayer time Friday. And um, we talk about prayer and different things. The last two Fridays, I addressed some issues, so... I want you to watch those messages, read the scriptures, um, just go back to the scriptures basically and read the scriptures because we're having so many false prophets and false teachers out there that are just merchandising the people of God. There's so many twisted um, new age and different um, uh, um what you call it they're mixing like new age into the church they're bringing all this mysticism there's different things and it, it the time doesn't permit to break down each one but you have to study the word when you study the word the bible says you know these people are going to be so skillful that even the very elect if if it were possible they could deceive the elect you have to be the elect of god that's your responsibility you see, these people, these prosperity bandits, these prosperity teachers and liars and these wicked prophets, lying prophets, because they're not prophets. They are just sorcerers. They don't teach you holiness. They don't teach you the believer's responsibility. As you're going to see, we are in the book of John and you're going to see the responsibility of the believer. You've got to live holy. You've got to do right. You have to spread the gospel. But these people are out there. So the last two Fridays, last Friday and this Friday, I addressed some things. So watch the video, share the videos with others so that you can be protected. You want to be God's elect so that these people don't fool you. OK, but we are in the wonderful book of John and we are in the end. We are closing out. Oh, my God. This is the last chapter. Oh, what a beautiful book. But remember, it doesn't end here. You have to go back and study it out some more. This was a high overview. This was just like a helicopter view. You know, like when the... um. The FBI or the SWAT team, they go on these, you know, stealth missions and they would just creep in and creep out. This was one of those stealth missions, you know, casing the land. So now, now that we're in the last chapter and we're on the last lesson, I want you to go back now and study it out, my friend. You're going to get more. You're, you're going to experience the love of God. You're going to experience the love of Jesus when you go through it on your own and study it. I've studied this book so many times and every time I go through it, sometimes I cry and it just moves into my spirit, my heart, and it strengthens me and fortifies me. So I encourage you because whatever I share, it's just small points. But when you go and you study it, you get more. So it's just a little overview we're doing just to inspire you and to spend time with you and so that some people don't feel alone but you know that God has his people out there you know who are pounding the pavement we are sharing the gospel we're sharing the love of Christ and it's about the word it's not about all these people you see on these Christian channels that they're just not living right you have to get into this for you for yourself amen and we can do it together there are a few channels on YouTube that they teach you the word they teach you the right way they don't sugarcoat anything they don't tell you lies and prophecy and have, every day they got a prophecy god said and god said when they start with the god said and god said and they can't get out of the god said switch the channel come to the word go to the word on your own amen so that's my little soapbox but we're in the book of john yes so we're in chapter 21 and in chapter 21 we talked about in the last lesson, because I skipped the lesson um, a couple of Mondays. Uh, I think one or one Monday I skipped the lesson. Um, but now we're here and we're closing it out. And so in the last lesson, we talked about, you know, Jesus showing himself um, to the disciples. 
And when he went out there, they were fishing. Remember in the last lesson, they were fishing and they fished all night and they didn't catch anything. And here comes Jesus. And he was all the way on the shore and he said, cast it on the right side, cast it on the other side. And when they cast it on the other side, the Bible said the net was so full, it almost broke. And another translation translated it, the net was so full, they had to call for help. So each translation, this is not a part of the actual synoptic gospel. The synoptic gospel is really Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But again, John was there because remember, he was a forerunner. So each individual told a story, but the crust of the story is true. That's how the courts know you're lying. When they hear three different versions, the actual truth doesn't change. The center or the core doesn't change. And the core was Jesus was on the shore. And Jesus told them to cast the net on the other side. And they caught the fish. So whether the net broke and they called for help, whether the, they, whether they pulled up the net and the net all, almost broke and they didn't call for help, the crust and the core was Jesus said, cast it on that side. And the manifestation took place, you see. So when you read the stories and you read the version, so he said, Jesus told them to put it on the other side. And they had worked all night, all night. And when um, they realized that it was Jesus, the Bible said, Peter got dressed because fishermen, they usually are half naked because they're in the water and you're wet. And he put on his clothes and he jumped in the water and swam ashore to see that it was Jesus, the Lord. Oh, mighty God. Beautiful. And so now we're going to pick up from there. So after they swam to shore, they got the fish and they got to the shore. Jesus in verse 12, we're going to pick up. Jesus said to them, listen to the word of God. Oh, I now you're going to see why I love this book. Oh, I want to just have a little praise break right now. But listen to what the Lord said to them. I after they fished all night. This is why I don't understand in these churches, you know, people got to have, um, nobody wants to be a servant. These preachers and pastors you see today, somebody got to carry the Bible and the book and the this and the that and blah, blah, blah. You know, they act like they can't walk on their own. They're not servants. They come to be served. They come to take your money, you know. They come in there and they act like they're so above. But look at Jesus. Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the king of kings. Jesus, after these men have fished all night long, because now they said it's morning, Jesus said to them, oh, come and dine. <laughs> Let that sink in. He said, come and dine. Jesus the Lord. He had died, paid for their sin. Heaven was satisfied. I want you to listen. He already died. This is the resurrected Jesus. And he resurrected. Heaven was paid. The debt was paid. And this Jesus, the Lord, said, come and dine. Mm. And none of the disciples, listen, just like us, the disciples were so taken aback. They were flabbergasted. And it says, and none of them ask him nothing. They wasn't going to say, are you really Jesus? Is that you, Lord? Is that you, Mama? No. You know, because they had a little doubt, like, what is he doing here? They were working. They were out fishing. So they didn't expect Jesus to show up on the shore. So they weren't going to ask him, what are you doing here, Master? What are you doing Cooking, lighting a fire, master. Because by then they knew he was Lord. They knew he was risen. But he came on the shore. That's how good God is. That's how loving Christ is to you and to me. He said, come and dine. Come and dine. Oh. And it says they would not ask him. Knowing that it's the Lord. And so Jesus said, Jesus then come it and he take the bread and he give to them and the fish. He's feeding them. Mm, 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 mm. And you got these so-called preachers who can't even, I tell you, look at Jesus. This is the example. He's a servant. And that's what true servanthood is about. 
and here it says in verse 14 this is the third time that jesus was showing himself to them so they they saw him before so it's not like they didn't know he was risen they were like we don't we, we don't want to ask if that's him you know we don't we don't want to fact check they just went with the flow this was the third time he showed himself so when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter. So remember the story with Peter denying Christ and all this stuff. Now Jesus is addressing Peter one-on-one -on -one in front of the rest of them. Now he's got something to say to Peter. Notice Jesus didn't hang him. He didn't carry him nor bring him about denying him. Jesus knew. Listen, I always say to you, Jesus knows your heart. Always make sure your heart is right. Make Make sure you got a clean heart and the right spirit. Sometimes we make mistakes. God is not going to come for you and pulverize you to the ground. No, you just ask him to forgive, repent. You know, listen, Jesus is our advocate. The problem is people just stay in the sin and they stay in it and they stay in it and then they justify it. That's when it's a problem. When you justify the wrong that you have done instead of repenting like some of these preachers you see in the pulpit that commit adultery and lies and, and pilfering and stealing and extortion. Instead of repenting, you know, they try to justify it and blame mental illness and blame emotional distress, blame their mama, their papa and everybody else instead of taking the responsibility. But Jesus knew the heart of Simon Peter. And your heart is the place that you have to guard and keep right before God, people. So Jesus addressed him. He said, Simon Peter, son of Jonas, lovest thou these? Pointing to the fish now. He said, lovest this? And, and he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus was saying, do you love this more than you love me? And he goes, you know I love you. But you see... This is what we would call belly full. He was eating up the fish because they were fishing all night. They were hungry now. And Jesus said, come and dine. They were eating. And Jesus was interrupting this man, fooling his belly, saying, you love me? He said, yeah, 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 I love you. Right? He said, you know I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. He said unto him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, yes, Lord, you know, I love you. I love you. And Jesus respond, then feed my sheep. Ha! He said to him a third time, you thought I was done. No, I wasn't. Jesus then say verse 17. He said unto him a third time, Simon. And I mean, listen, you know, when we were growing up, when your mama called you by your full name, you know, they holler at the first name, your middle name, your last name and your papa's name. And they call you, you know, you're in trouble now because you're like, Lord, have mercy. What have I done? Lord, have mercy. What have I done? So Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And now he got greedy because now he got to stop eating and swallow the food and stop eating and give Jesus his attention. You see? Sometimes when you hear your name called a couple of times, somebody's trying to get your attention. Jesus was trying to draw out of him something that he was cavalierly. He was just responding in a cavalier way. And he got grieved and he, because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, knowest, you know all things and you know that I love you. You see that? You see that? He knew in his, Peter knows in his heart, his heart was right. He loved the Lord. There was no doubt of his love, even when he doubted Jesus. That's why you got to read this word. Even when he denied Jesus with, with the, the, the situation, it didn't mean he didn't love the Lord. He was just in, he was just overwhelmed. And sometimes you react by your flesh. You react before you could, it sinked in, you know, go back to the message. I explained it. You see? And so he was like, you know, my heart, you know, all things. And if we as believers would realize and recognize that God knows all things, he knows you, he knows you. So that's why when the apostle was teaching, he said, listen, come boldly, come boldly before the throne of grace. 
say what you gotta say. Tell God. He already knows it. He knows all things, but he wants you to come and pour out and be honest. David said, what God desires most of all is the truth on the inward parts of us. God just wants the truth on the inward man. You can lie to your friends and your neighbors, but God knows all things in here. And if you would bring it to here, bring him your weakness, bring him your questions, bring him your trouble, bring him whatever thing that ails you and bothers you, bring it to him. He'll set it straight. He'll help you. He'll help you. But you see, many Christians and church people, they live a lie. They go to church pretending like they think God don't know. Simon Peter says, but Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. And Jesus said the same thing, then feed my sheep. You see, sometimes the Lord will pull out of us what's already in us. You see, you can't pull out of somebody what's not there. Like women who marry men who hit them. If he was hitting you before, if he yelled at you and called you the female dog and disrespects you before, and you're going to walk down some aisle with your daddy and marry this wicked, abusive man, and then thinking that when you marry him, you're going to change him. You dated a man who's stingy and mean, mean, won't even give you a dollar to buy a can of soda, and you're going to marry him just because you want to say you're married. I is married now. And you walk down and thinking that you're going to change this man. Or you marry this woman who embarrasses you in front of your family. She yells at you. She condescends you. She puts you down. She takes your manhood and you marry her anyway. After your mama told you don't marry her. You marry a woman who disrespects your mother in front of you. And you marry her thinking you're going to change her. You can't pull out of anybody what's not there. If it's not there, you are pulling straws and straws. It's not there. And that's what people do. They try to, you know, marry people to change. And you can't change nobody, honey. Only God can do that. But you see, Jesus knew what was in his heart. And so he pulled it out, pulled it out. And he said, feed my sheep. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself and thou walkest whither thou wouldest. In other words, when you were young, you did what you want to do. You see, Jesus got your number. He got the 411. He said, but when thou was old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou go, whither thou wouldst not. In other words, you get to a point when you're old now, you don't have that strength and that agility to do what you want. You need somebody to push you in a wheelchair. This he spake, signifying by what death he would be glorified. And when he had spoken this, he said, follow me. I don't want you to miss that. Because in all of our ministries and our purpose, you, I got a purpose and you have a purpose. You have to follow Christ. You have to follow Christ. That's the foundation of what we do. You have to follow Christ. Lots of times people go to church or whatever organization and they follow the organization instead of following Christ and the word. You don't join anything that's not attached to the word. You don't go to any church and follow what's not word or in the word or Bible based. I don't care what they concoct. If it's not in the word and Bible based or the foundation is Christ, then you better back up, back all the way up out of it. And so he continued and, you know, uh, he talked in front of the disciples and um, different things. And, you know, he says, let me see, verse 25. And he says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they would be written, every one of them, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain, none of it could have been contained in this book that should be written. So he says there was more things and more stuff that Jesus did and said that it couldn't be contained in this letter, the book of John. He said it couldn't be contained. It was so much. So what do we say about this? You're invited. 
Jesus said, come and die. You are invited. And Jesus, in this time, you know, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. And he's the king of king and lord of lord. And he sat down and he invited them to eat. He invited them to eat. He made the fire. He did everything. And they dared not ask him, Lord, what are you doing? He's Lord. But yet Jesus didn't have a problem serving his disciples. How many churches have you gone to where the pastors serve you? Mm -hmm. They always want to be served. Everybody want to sit at their little stupid table. Because everybody want to be important. We have this thing in the churches now where everybody want to be important. Everybody want an important seat. Everybody wants to be important. Everybody, you know. Nobody wants to be humble. And we have to change that. Remember when Jesus was teaching in the gospel, in the synoptic gospel, and he said this. He said, if somebody comes in the church, <clears throat> I don't want to get into the whole hermeneutics and exegesis text, but he said, if a rich man comes in all dressed, smelling sweet, you put him to sit up front. But if a raggedy, dirty, poor man comes, you put him to sit in the back. Ask yourself, why is that? You know, and we see time and again in the culture, people just try to push those who don't wear designer. And you see it on these reality shows. You know, they, they judge each other and they measure, measure each other by the designer that they wear and the cars that they drive. That's how they... They measure you and that's how they, you know, give you status because of what you wear. And they condescend to other people who don't. You know, when you call people the help and poor and he don't have money. And you hear these nasty, nasty people talking about other people's um, socioeconomic status because you think that you make a little dollar. You're better than the next person. But let me tell you something, sweethearts. Sickness doesn't have a socioeconomic status on there because sickness will take anybody down in a minute, no matter what your status. So in, in verses 15 through about 16, you see him re, re, restoring Peter because when he's speaking to Peter here, he's putting Peter in charge. Peter was the first bishop of the church. He was in charge of the church after Jesus went back to heaven and the Holy Spirit came. Peter was in charge of the church. Peter was the first bishop. So Jesus gave him authority. Jesus was giving him authority. And Jesus used the term feed my sheep because, again, it was a culturally familiar, um, what you would say, livelihood, way of life. And so he used that because remember, Jesus always speak metaphorically, he speaks in allegories. And so he said, feed my sheep because he was telling him, you are going to be that shepherd. Just like Jesus, just like God is our shepherd. He was going to be like that earthly shepherd over the sheep of God, over the children of God. And so he said, feed my sheep, you're in charge. So he puts it. And sometimes, like I said, he asked him three times, not because he, he didn't hear, but he was pulling out of him. He was pulling his attention because he's leaving him a charge. And so Jesus asked him and asked him again and asked him again. And sometimes in our walk and in our purpose, we're wondering, why is God taking so long to put me out on the forefront? Why is God taking so long with the calling? Uh, and because he's pulling it out of you. He's getting you ready. Sometimes you think you're ready, but it's not time. And so he asked him once, he asked him again, and he asked him again. He wanted his attention. He pulled him into that place where he had to stop and said, wait a minute. You know all things. Nothing is hidden from you. And the all things he was talking about wasn't the out, outer things. It was the internal things. See, Simon Peter knew that. That Jesus knew internally the depths he could see beyond the realm and knows what's in the heart. He said, you know all things. You know that I love you. 
And so sometimes God will pull out of us through seasons. Yes. Through seasons in our lives, pull out of pull out the love of God that's in us. Is it easy? The Bible said Peter got angry. He got grieved. He got sorrowful and hurt. You questioning my love? And so he pulled that out of him. And sometimes with the seasons that we go through our little training, that love within us will come out. And he said, Lord, you know, I love you, you know, and they use the word ag agapos, you know, agape, agapos. That's the love that he had for Christ. And when you go through your seasons, you'll see that the love of God will ooze out of you that you didn't really know that was there. And so some commentators say, you know, his first two responses were uh, the phileo, you know, the friendly love. Like, yeah, you know, I love you while he eats the fish, you know, like he said it nonchalantly. Yeah, I love you like in a friendly and cavalier way. That's not the answer Jesus wants. Jesus wanted a committed answer, a committed love. Because sometimes the Lord will speak into our spirit, impress in our spirit, and we're like, yeah, mm hmm. Or we hear the word from the pulpit, and we're like, mm hmm, mm hmm. That's not the response He wanted. He wanted a connected, your brain connect to what your heart, to what your mouth is saying. They were eating. He said, come and dine. Don't forget they were eating. They were hungry. And so he wanted to connect the words to the heart, to what's up in here and to what's in here. And he got grieved. And sometimes the Lord have to pull and ask us again because, you know, we come to the Lord. I believe I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But then five minutes later, we go out cussing and fussing and go out and we're sinning and we're drinking and we're smoking and we go back to the lifestyle we were accustomed to. But then somebody else have to come and say, hey, aren't you saved? You see. And so he pulled it out of him. He centered him. And he said, then feed my sheep. Take care of my my people. So he gave him a charge and a command and he put him in a place of authority. He gave him a charge. He's like, take good care. Tend my sheep. Take good care of my sheep, the people. We have to be